Welcome to the Turtle Nexus for another Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles explainer video. Today, I will be talking about a mini-series informally known as The River, a story that may never be able to get reprinted again. It was 1989. The Turtles finally returned to New York and defeated the Shredder for the last time. It seemed like the Turtles were about to begin a new chapter in their lives. But it was also the time of Turtle Mania, a marketing storm that took place between 1989 and 1991 mostly fueled by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles adaptations to cartoons, comics, video games, toys, and movies. In the midst of Turtle Mania, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird were overwhelmed with managerial obligations, and they couldn't really sit down and work on new issues. At the same time, they had friends and colleagues that wanted to tell Turtle stories, so they decided to let them do that in the main TMNT title. This period of time is known as the Guest Era, and lasted, with a few interruptions, until 1992. Most of these issues were later classified as non-canon, but some of them were pretty much in continuity when they came out. One of the most memorable stories of this period also had very complicated repercussions. I am talking about the River Trilogy. This story was written and penciled by Rick Fitch. Fitch was known at the time for his work on The Swamp Thing, for DC Comics, and the proto-Vertigo era of the character. He worked alongside Alan Moore in some of the most important issues in the history of the character, including the first appearance of John Constantine. After Moore left Swamp Thing, Fitch became the main writer for a few years, and he was going to end his run in issue number 92, to be followed by Jamie Delano, but he ran into problems with DC management over issue number 88, which would have been the first DC work for another TMNT artist, Michael Zully. In this issue, Swamp Thing would have ended up in the past and met a character that was basically Jesus, who in this version would have been called Nazarin, and he was a hedge wizard. Perhaps the big red flag for DC editorial was the cover of the issue, implying that Swamp Thing would become Jesus' crucifix by the end of this chapter. Despite originally being okayed by editors Karen Berger and Dick Giordano, the then-DC editor-in-chief, Jeanette Kahn considered the story too risky for publication and considering the level of sales at the moment. They couldn't afford a boycott, and this was during a time DC was known for their progressive takes on their properties. Fitch tried to alter the story to make it less inflammable, but they couldn't agree on a resolution, and both Fitch and Zully quit the title. DC tried to fill his spot with both Jamie Delano and Neil Gaiman, who were already working for other projects at DC but they refused the position, out of respect for Vitch. His spot would be filled by Doug Wheeler, and the original issue number 88 remained unpublished, even to these days. Burned by his experience at DC, Vitch went to his friends at Mirage Studios and decided to do a few issues for this guest era during TMNT Volume 1. His story was a horror trilogy that revolved around the mysteries of the Connecticut River. Vitch brought a Swamp Thing sensitivity to the Turtles that fitted very well in the established world, and even though he had problems getting the characters right, they are not completely out of the possibilities of themselves. The first chapter, known as Down to the River, took place after the Turtles returned to New York to put an end to the Shredder. They returned to Northampton, where they continued learning under the tutelage of Master Splinter. One day after practice, the Turtles ran into some turtle hatchings on the riverbed, only to be surprised by a leech. The other Turtles, still angry at Raphael for the way he behaved during practice, and knowing he hated leeches, forced one onto his foot. Raphael would eventually get rid of it, sparing its life. The next day, Raphael would feel a little unfocused, and after seeing something attacking a snapping turtle in the river, they decided to dive in and help it. They followed the mysterious creature into a cave. There, they realized it was a very big leech. Raphael decided to clog the entrance to the cave with his carapace to give his brothers time to get their weapons. By the time the other turtles returned, they found Raphael barely conscious. The leech was able to suck his blood through the carapace, and it now had arms and legs. Leonardo sliced the leech and they escaped with Raphael. Over the following days, Raphael would start regressing, becoming more and more childlike, losing muscle and eventually going back to being an oversized baby turtle. Splinter realized then that whatever made them mutants was still in their blood, and that leech sucked out all the chemical mutagen from him. Their only chance at reverting Raphael back to mutant was to find whatever was left of that leech. While searching for it in the river, they would get surprised by a Massachusetts fish and gain policemen. He put his hands on Raphael and revealed that he was the leech, now in humanoid form. Bloodsucker escaped, but Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Donatello went after him to save their brother and to prevent human deaths. 
The second chapter was named River Hip. In this one, the turtles followed the trace of the bloodsucker, but ended up needing to get saved by a Native American known as a Banak, the last surviving member of the Algonquin Nation. This seems to be inspired by the Algonquian peoples that have lived in New England for centuries, with Abanak possibly being a reference to the Abenaki peoples. Abanak explained to them that 400 years ago, the river was their home and the caves were their holy place, the place where they honored their dead, until the white man came and started using the river for power and the sacred ground for factories. To make things worse, after the Water Quality Act of 1965 was passed, all industrial waste that couldn't be dumped into the river was illegally dumped into the underground river instead. The turtles decided to help Abanak stop the pollution by clogging the pipe. The owner of the factory managed to escape the confrontation, but was eventually killed by Bloodsucker. The turtles and Abanak decided then to travel north to seek advice from the ancient spirit of the river, hoping he could find a way to help Raphael. Which takes us to the last part of the trilogy, Old Man River. The turtles and Abanak arrived at a hidden lake that was the true origin of the river. There, they found an old druid. The old man told them that in the time of the dinosaurs, there was a highly technological civilization of learning that rose and died very quickly. The few survivors forswore all technology, but were still hungry for knowledge. The earth soon unlocked her deepest secrets to them, and they discovered that the rivers of the world were conduits of planetary energy. By tapping into these power lines, they accelerated their learning until they transcended the flesh and merged completely with the rivers. Each river in the world is haunted by one of these druids to our days, still searching for knowledge and hungry to learn all that was new. The old man would eventually reveal that all that has been happening to Raphael was all his doing. The mutagen picked his interest, and he sent Bloodsucker to get it all. He soon started using his psychic powers to subdue the turtles, but with the help of a Banak and a psychic attack by Splinter, they were able to defeat him. Raphael managed to get his mutagen back, bite for bite, until Bloodsucker went back to becoming a simple leech. A Banak became the new old man, and the druid started reverting back until he became a human embryo. At the end of the story, the leech kills the embryo, pretty intense. April and Casey had their little plot in this story, and this is one of the early signs that the two would eventually be in a romantic relationship. The story got referenced in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 28, a follow-up story also known as Sons of the Silent Age, written by Steve Murphy and penciled by Jim Lawson, with flashbacks by Kevin Eastman and Rick Vitch. You may know some details about this story because it was adapted into the 2003 cartoon. The turtles were still processing all that happened to them during the river saga, and they went on a trip through the river in a raft. After defeating the Shredder, the turtles were no longer sure of what their path as warriors was. They felt a little lost in life. They passed by a nuclear plant, and then they decided to change streams until they found a nice riverside to start a bonfire. Then, they were surprised by a dying amphibian woman, probably caused by the radioactive pollution of the plant. They tried to resuscitate her, but they were unsuccessful. While they were trying to save her, four fishmen came out of the water, thinking that the turtles were hurting her. After a brief fight, they realized what their intentions were. This is when April figured out that those four were the last of their species, and now unable to reproduce, just like the turtles, another reason why they did not know what their paths should be. After the guest era ended, and Peter and Kevin returned to the book, most of those stories were considered non-canon, but there was nothing in the river that couldn't fit into continuity. In fact, because Sons of the Silent Age was written by Murphy, a Mirage staff member, and that story was a follow-up to the river, that should make the river canon. In Peter Laird's words, the events of that story fit nicely into Mirage continuity. So, why hasn't this story been reprinted since 1991? It all has to do with that stressful period of time called Turtle Mania. At that time, Kevin and Peter were completely overwhelmed by several lawsuits and legal chores. The work was so stressful, Mirage was becoming unmanageable. The guest-era artist worked on the title without any special contracts. They obviously didn't own the Turtles, but any new characters and concepts would be owned by them. Whenever they needed to reprint or collect those issues, all the profits would need to get divvied up with all the creators involved. Sometimes they had to do buy-up contracts for certain characters, but in the end, Mirage lawyers advised a retroactive work for higher contract. 
If you are not familiarized with how this works, this was probably the main reason these creators ended up in an indie publisher like Mirage. A work for hire contract means that any new character or concept created under it belongs to the entity who paid for the job. This is how publishers like Marvel and DC managed to accumulate so many characters over the years. But a retroactive contract for the guest artists in TMNT would mean that they wouldn't see any additional money from reprints or adaptations. Some of these contracts proved to be somewhat fair, especially to the guys that created characters for the toys or the style guide, who still get royalties whenever the designs or the toys get re-released. But Vich, who had so much bad history working for hire, and already witnessed what happened to his collaborator Alan Moore with the rights to Watchmen, didn't want to sign any contracts. This means that the River Trilogy is in a legal limbo. It couldn't be reprinted by Mirage, and while the material itself is owned by Viacom, reprinting it would open up the gates for a lawsuit. This complicated all kinds of collected editions around the world, and because it's a Ninja Turtles story, it cannot be reprinted by any other entity either. A similar character to Bloodsucker is often mentioned. Wern, this other character, was created by Ryan Brown for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures and was later made into a toy. Worm is not a mutated leech, but a planarian worm, although their powers are very similar. Except for the 2012 version, which was more of a mix yes piddle eek ripoff. Will they ever find a solution? It's hard to say. Mirage had a similar situation with Dave Sim, a story that was already covered by this other explainer video, but Sim eventually gave them the permission to reprint the issue. I think the solution would be to create a different kind of contract similar to whatever worked for Dave Sim, or whatever gets done for the different crossovers between the Turtles and properties from other companies like Batman or Yuzagi Yojimbo. In the meantime, you can chase the issues in comic book stores. That is all for today. Press the like button if you liked this video. Thanks for watching.